Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you didn't forget to go to the lab. I forgot to send you a reminder about that. Uh, did Jeffrey send you a reminder about the lab? No. no? Were you supposed to go to, did someone here who was supposed to go to the lab today and didn't go? Okay. Well, remember that we have laboratory this week, today and tomorrow. Uh, it's about triaxial testing. Okay. Um, so, let's uh, continue talking about faults. So, so far uh, we have seen that uh, how we can create faults, what is the genesis of faults. And we say that it's involved mostly with tectonic strains. In this example, uh, we have a compressive environment in which the tectonic plates, they push from the sides and that results in that results in uh, stresses in this direction that combine with the vertical stress to create a shear fracture. And I have one example here, one toy example from Professor Prodanovich uh, to help demonstrate the effect of how a fault forms, okay? So let, let me see if I can get this right because I want you to see this on the screen. Probably you cannot see this very well from there, so I need to use a mirror here. Let's see. Um, yeah, yeah, but uh, still it's not showing very well. Okay. Let, let me clean it a little bit. Hope this is going to work. Mm, no. Can I get it there? Okay, well, I see the rig. I see the rig now. But. Well, it's too dark, unfortunately. Let me see if I turn off the light. Okay. So. I got it. <coughs> but now it's not focusing in there. Okay, now uh, I, I think I think this. Well, bro, what? Let's see. Let's see. I think it's focusing on the on the mirror itself, on the edges. But well, you you probably I'm gonna ask you to to try to see from where you are, okay? And I'll see if I can put this next to the camera later. But but basically uh, here I have layers. I hope you you can see. Uh, you sh guys should be looking here rather than uh, to the screen. And this is gonna be the tectonic strength, okay? So. If I push in, you're going to see how the block in the middle goes up and there is an uplift. We're going to see in a bit that this is what is called a reverse fault or a thrust fault in which I have a compressive tectonic strain and this part goes up. That's how mountains are created. Uh, on the contrary, let me come back and start in the original position. If I have an extensional environment in which I have a constant pressure, an overburden, and then in this environment I have extensional <coughs> strains that extend in this direction, what's going to happen is th this is going to go down and we're going to get a normal fault. Okay? So, let me see if I can get this in, in here. Hopefully I don't make a mess. So I think I'm gonna no, I'm gonna mess up the layers. Okay. Well probably you can see more or less over there, right? So tectonic strain, 
a compressive, then we have an uplift, we have a, a reverse orbit or a thrust fall. Notice how this one is going up. And when I have an extension environment, the block goes down. Okay? All right, so, yes. Well, tectonically passive would mean that they, they are not, not, there are no strains either in compression or in extension, that there, there, there is nothing going on. So it's not, not exactly the same. But normal fault can come out of the complete passive environment. Yes, yes. Well, when your uh, overburden stress surpasses your horizontal stress, you also go are going to have faults. Uh, all right, so let's come back over here. And uh, we talked about this. And, and remember, that now we have shear fractures, OK? I'm, I'm going to get back to this. Shear fract fractures are not the same as hydraulic fractures. And that's going to be one of the main points to discuss uh, today. And we talk about what are uh, strike and dip. And these are very important uh, values that you need to know uh, how to interpret those uh, because later we're gonna need that in order to solve stresses on faults. And uh, we talk a little bit about how we can map those strike and strip in a stereo net. And again, I recommend that you check that uh, app that I showed in, in class. I put a link already in the problems in the in the notes online. And now we get to talk about strength of faults and ideal uh, orientation of faults. So uh, a fault uh, very similar to what you saw here, it doesn't have any cohesive strength. Uh, a fault is a rock or it's an, in, an interface in a rock in a geological formation which has already been broken. So if it's already broken, then there is no cohesive or cementation strength in the fault. Or if there is, it's, it's very, very minor. So if there is no cohesive strength, uh, what is going to be left in the fault? Is it going to, to resist any stress? Is it going to be capable to resist uh, stresses. For example, as in this diagram, if I have an effective stress from the size sigma three, uh, is it going to be able to resist a stress sigma one? What do you think, yes or no? No, you say no? Anyone say yes? Yes, why? Okay, but uh, um, there's something missing here. So we're saying that, that, imagine this as a rock, okay? It's already broken. My question is if, if I put stress around this, I'm going to be able to resist a stress in this direction, which is higher than sigma three. Okay, so Mr. What, what's your last name? Mr. Nolas, you say no. Uh, any anyone else has a different opinion? So let me write down here that in the interface we have no cohesion. But if you remember, when we were talking about sand and we were talking about coffee, also, also there was no cohesion. But we could put stress on it. So what was the reason for that? What was behind that additional strength? It has to do with confining pressure, but it's not what is actually opposing. It's friction, right? So al although this interface has no cohesion, still has a frictional strength. 
the higher the normal stress on the interface, the higher the shear stress is going to be able to, to resist. And similar to what we saw for unconsolidated sediments uh, for faults, is going to be exactly the same. And sigma 3 or sigma 1, the maximum sigma 1 that we can apply, is going to be related to sigma 3 according to uh, an equation which is going to be, we're going to assume it's in a straight line. And it just depends on the friction parameter Q, where Q is equal to 1 plus sine of the friction angle by the 1 minus sine of the friction angle and if friction angle for example is equal to 30 degrees that's a good number to remember Q is going to be equal to 3 um, in other words what this equation is telling you and let's assume these values just to, to remember these numbers is that even if you have faults even if your uh, formation is broken by faults it's still going to be able to resist stresses which are different in different directions but there is going to be a limit and the limit is going to depend on the frictional strength of the fault and in general uh, to uh, remember this number it can be higher than three times the minimum principal stress. So the maximum principal stress cannot be higher than three times the minimum principal stress. Otherwise, uh, you're going to have fault slip. That's the maximum value at which you can increase sigma one. So for example, if I were to run a test on this sample, which is already broken, and uh, I have some sigma three, which is different than zero um, for example here I'm measuring the formation in direction one I will see that at the beginning probably I'll have an elastic response as I start to apply a, a stress and sigma one increases but sigma one is going to reach a value and it's not going to increase anymore after I reach that limit after that point the fall is going to slip and the maximum stress is going to be this equation that we put there uh, before. Okay, we're going to get back to this later on because it is very useful to estimate horizontal stresses whenever we don't have a lot of information about uh, horizontal stresses. But there is something else that I want to discuss right now uh, which is what will be the ideal orientation of a fault uh, given that it fails at some uh, characteristic state of stress. So let me expand now this plot and make it in three dimensions. Uh, let's say that now I'm loading a prismatic element where I have sigma 3 in this direction the least principal stress I have a sigma 2 which is higher than sigma 3 and then I start to apply a stress which is higher than sigma 3 and sigma 2 and it is sigma 1 and I get to a point in which it fails. My question now is, what is going to be the orientation of such plane in three dimensions? We did this before in two dimensions. If you remember, uh, we found that that was related to the Mohr circle and there was a characteristic angle. And you have done also this in the laboratory uh, to observe where a shear fracture is going to develop. So, um, 
what what do you think? Uh, where is that shear plane is going to be? Let me see if I can use some help here too. So, um, this is kind of too big. Let me try with this. This is a plane of sigma 1, perpendicular to sigma 1. And this is a plane of, of sigma 3. The shear fracture is going to be located, as we learned before, at an angle that I'm going to call beta <coughs> equal to 45 degrees plus the friction angle divided by 2 from the plane of the maximum stress towards the plane of the minimum stress. So <coughs> if this is the plane of the maximum stress, right here, and this is the plane of the minimum principal stress, that means that the plane of failure is going to be going from here to there at an angle somewhere over there. If the friction angle is 30 degrees, what is going to be the angle beta? 60 degrees, right? So it's going to be an angle higher than 45. And let me trace that dash line that it uh, means that that's the angle of failure. And I'm saying that this is an angle beta. Well, notice now, now this is where it comes the third dimension. In the third dimension, this angle is going to be, or this plane is going to be like that. And it is going to be aligned with the intermediate principal stress. Let me explain why th this is the case. What is the minimum principal stress? Sigma 3. What is the maximum principal stress? Sigma 1. If you remember, when we talked about hydraulic fractures, we said hydraulic fractures always open perpendicular to sigma 3 because that's what requires the least amount of energy. Okay? Well, in this case, it's similar, but it's not exactly the same because now this is a shear fracture. And the shear fracture, as it is created, uh, probably you, you, you can see this already in your head. You can do the animation. The top uh, block, which is the hanging wall, is going to move down, and this one is going to move up if I continue pushing with sigma 1, right? That's what is going to happen. This one is going to move down, and this one is going to move up. And if you follow that movement, you will always also see that this block is going to push to the side, opposing sigma 3 in this direction, and it's going to go along sigma 1 in this direction. So in three dimensions now, this fault is always going to move opposing sigma 3 because that's also the least amount of energy in order to move this block. Why would it move against sigma 2 if sigma 2 is higher than sigma 3? There's no reason for that. So if you now imagine this block moving, then the most convenient energy configuration is to be for this plane to move against sigma 3. So because that's going to be uh, the case in which you spend the least amount of energy. OK. So yes. Oh, okay. Uh, that, that's a great point. So, there are actually two solutions to this problem. One is this solution, and the other one is what is called a conjugate uh, solution. Let me let me move this around so I can make it next to it. And.
I could run the same experiment and if conditions were a little bit different, uh, some heterogeneity or something that is causing the fracture to start in the other location, it could start here. And, but the angle is going to be the same and it, this is going to be also a plane that contains the intermediate principal stress. And this angle is also beta. Those are two possible solutions for shear fractures. So for shear fractures, we have always two solutions. For hydraulic fractures, it's just one. But for shear fractures, there are two solutions. And now th this is something that it's very important that you remember because if you understand the the forces, the stresses, and the kinematics of these flocks, how they move in relation to sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3, it's going to be very easy for you to extrapolate these results to either normal faulting, strike slip, or reverse faulting. In all the cases, it's exactly the same. It's just that the stresses are going to come from different directions. But remember that always, this plane is going to be a plane which is a combination between the plane of sigma 1 and sigma 3 and it is contained or it's aligned with the intermediate principal stress sigma 2. All right so let's see an example uh, utilizing what we have already seen. Let's say that you need to drill in a place uh, which is subjected to normal faulting. Okay, I'm drawing here a block, block diagram. So somewhere over here you have your drill rig and, and here we're gonna have a well bore. And let's say that goes into the horizontal into a horizontal formation and now uh, because I'm saying I'm assuming this is normal faulting and because this is normal faulting then uh, I'm gonna remind you that this is a case for normal faulting and now I'm going to assume that the minimum principal stress well I didn't write the minimum principal stress but we should, you should already know if I'm drilling the wellbore in this direction what is the direction of the minimum principal stress and we're going to add a little bit more reality to this this is going to be the north, this is going to be the east and this is going to be the direction down so in which direction is minimum horizontal stress striking east west right so this is going to be sh mean uh, somewhere over here perpendicular to that we're going to have sh max and over here we're going to have sv which is also applied from the top okay so my question now is based on what you see over here what is going to be the most likely location and orientation of faults in this location? And now I want you to tell me, uh, I see some of you waving your hands, probably some other of you are trying to think this in your in mentally, but now we have some tools in order to tell exactly what is the orientation of those faults. So remember, this is strike and this is dip. What is going to be the strike and dip of those faults? I'll, I'll let you work on that for a minute, okay? Uh, take this and apply it there, solve it on your own, and uh, if, you, if you do it now, you will see that it will be very easy to remember later on. I want you to tell me what is going to be the strike and dip of such faults of faults okay not not of 
hydraulic fractures. Well, you may also find the strike and dip of a hydraulic fracture, but now I'd like to know the strike and dip of the faults. You can check your notes. I can also remind you that the strike is the angle between the north line and the line which is an intersection of the fault and a horizontal plane. And the, the dip is the angle between a horizontal plane and the steepest line on the fault. So, I'll give some extra points to the first one that gets the, right, the answer correct and dares to answer. Uh, okay, so Omar said that dip is zero. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's the case. So. Okay, Mr. Moan, right? Moin. Ah, uh, okay, okay, uh, good, good point. I didn't tell you that in this formation, the friction angle is 30 degrees. Down, okay, okay, Let, let's agree. Uh, strike, you're saying it's zero, right? Yeah. Everyone agrees with zero or anyone disagrees with that? Okay, zero. And remember, th this is the way we write the the strike with the the azimuth notation. And what about the dip? It could dip towards the either or towards the west, depending on the fault, right? So, uh, let me, uh, Mr. Wheeler, you're saying. North uh, of the, the strike or the. No, I'm just saying, like, to read it out, like, from the north line, like, 600 degrees, you can do like that. The, are you talking about the dip? Yeah. No, the dip is always me measured as an angle, uh, and then you may say in which direction is dipping. Okay. Okay. Um, but uh, le let's <laughs> assume now that, for example, this is a formation in which you're drilling a horizontal wellbore, and we're gonna put those faults uh, that Mr. Moyne was saying. And just for simplicity, I'm going to assume that this is, the faults are just going in one direction. And let's say they are dipping, the solution is six degrees, okay? Because it is this angle over there. And let's say those are going to the east. And that, what that would mean is that this is a fault which is something like this. And let's say that we have another fault somewhere over there. And if this is a normal fault, also, if this is our, for example, shale formation, that would mean that if this is in this direction, it is like this. And this section is also going in this direction, okay? So in uh, normal faults, always the hanging wall goes down and the, foot, uh, the hanging wall goes down and the foot wall goes up relative to the fault. Okay, and Let's uh, continue this example by saying that uh, close to here uh, also, um, let me see. Uh, no, no, okay, I don't wanna make it more complicated right now. 
But uh, that, that would be the strike and deep for the fault. Uh, uh, everyone agrees with that? Everyone understands why? Could you, could you draw the angle for the depth if possible? The angle for the dip? No, so it is the angle for the dip would be this angle, okay. 60 degrees. And it will be the same as that angle. Okay? Yes? The strike is zero because, let me continue this line over here. I'm going to continue this fault and it's going to touch that point over there, okay? When the fault touches that point, the line of the fault is going to be this line. And look, that line goes in direction of the north. The angle between this line and the north coincide. That's why this, this is zero. Yes? No, it depends on the direction of, of this stress. So for example, if SH mean was pointing north-south, then the strike would be in the other direction. But let, let me uh, say what I mean. So now let's do a top view, okay? In a top view, if you had a place in which this is the minimum principal stress. This is the maximum pr principal stress. And again, this is normal faulting. Now, we, we can't see the deep of, of, the, of the faults, okay? But we're gonna see, be able to see the strike. Uh, what will be the strike this is the same as the case before. The strike of those uh, faults will be in this direction, right? You will see those faults going down like this. Uh, yes. And if you were to look from the side, you may see, let, let's do this on surface, that probably you will have something like this. These are going to be normal faults. And probably you can have a surface which is lower over there and higher over here. Let's say this is a, the formation that you're looking at or you're mapping is going to be like this. So, uh, in fact, sometimes you can see these strike lines uh, from from a space or on surface. So, uh, as an example of the orientation of stresses, um, you may go and check, for example, the Appalachian Mountains. You, you will see that they are very well aligned with what caused them to, to form at the very beginning. Okay, so it's mostly flat around here. What are you guys doing for spring break? Anyone going skiing? <laughs> Studying? Sleeping. Yeah. I'm going to Big Ben. I think it's going to be lots of fun. So, okay. So, you, you see all, all these lines? So, those are mountain ranges, right? Uh, here we are in Virginia, Pennsylvania, Appalachians. And you see how the, the alignment responds to the state of stress. You may think also these as like wrinkles, right? But, but in here, you really have a lot of faults in it. And they are caused and they orient due to the state of stress that caused them to form at the very beginning. 
and you can see the same patterns in the subsurface. And that's what we want to, to understand to how to interpret. Okay, so, um, yes. Yes, from the from the horizontal plane, not from the x-axis. The dip is measured from the horizontal plane. So uh, let's say that this this is a fault, okay? And this is a horizontal plane. The dip is always the angle between the horizontal plane and and the plane itself. It doesn't matter what is a strike. The angle is going to be always the same. All right, so let's finish this problem because you're going to have to solve similar problems. Uh, tell me what is going to be the strike and dip for a hydraulic fracture now, also at this location. If you were able to map those ideal hydraulic fractures in this place. First of all, the hydraulic <coughs> fracture is going to be perpendicular to which stress? SH mean, right? So probably if I draw my hydraulic fracture going out a little bit out of the page, it's going to look something like this. And if I assume this is a planar fracture. And therefore, what is going to be the, the strike? This, this is a plane, okay? This is a plane goes out of the page and also goes inside the, the page. So what is the strike of that plane? Zero. It's also zero, very well. And what is the dip? 90 degrees. So that you now need to extend this concept to strike slip, to reverse faulting, and also to cases in which SH mean is not necessarily ori oriented with the east. But in all cases, it's going to be exactly the same. Uh, you have a question, uh, Mr. Moyne. Because this is a vertical, it's a vertical plane. So the angle between a horizontal plane and a vertical plane is 90 degrees. Because this is a hydraulic fracture. This is strike and dip for the hydraulic fracture. Yes? What's the maximum strike you can have? Uh, it depends on the orientation of SH mean. It can go all the way to 360 degrees. At, at, at that point, is equal to zero. So let's say 359, something like that. So it's from zero to 360. So when we have those two faults, yes. Do we want to be different? These ones? No, no, the, the two faults are the same. Yeah. The strike. So the strike of both of them is zero. Is there one in 360? Yes. So the strike, uh, let me draw it here. This will be the hidden side of the, of the fault. The strike is in the same direction. Uh, if you're picky, you will say that this one is zero and this one is 180. I'm going to explain that later, but but it's the same line. Okay, there's no, no need for us to, to get into into those details uh, right now. But it depends on the direction in which this is this one is dipping. All right, so I think we have some time, and I like that uh, we extend now this concept to strike slip and reverse faulting, okay? Um, for that, I'm going to, to need an entire page. And this is what I'm going to call ideal orientation of faults. And this is useful because one, it helps you understand what are the kind of faults and fractures you may expect that at a certain location or in the opposite case if you know what the faults look like you could say what are the likely stresses that are acting at that place so here we're going to have uh, normal faulting and strike slip and reverse. 
Okay, so we already did normal faulting. Uh, let's go with strike slip. Uh, strike slip, uh, we know that SH max is higher than SV and those two are higher than SH min. Let me orient conveniently a, a block in the subsurface which is oriented like this. And I'm going to have SH max along the long direction, SH min on this plane, and SV on that plane. And, and for all these cases, also I'm going to use a coordinate system, which is north, east, and depth. Okay. Uh, tell me what is going to be the strike and the uh, dip of these fractures assuming that the friction angle is 30 degrees in all the cases that we're going to see so i like to know strike and dip of a fault that will form in this case, if SH max uh, surpasses the strength of the material, what do you say? So try try to think on that for a bit. Uh, you have to apply. Let, let me help you a little bit. I'm going to move this down, and you just have to apply this to that. But notice that now the strikes and dips are not going to be the same as before. Okay. Uh, anyone has a solution? First of all, you have to notice there are going to be two solutions, okay? <coughs> and uh, for those two solutions, there is one variable which is going to be the same. Okay, so let me help you. Let's apply the rules that we learned over here. The shear fracture is going to be a plane that goes from the plane of sigma 1 to the plane of sigma 3, right? Which is sigma 1 in this case? Sigma h max. And which is sigma 3? Sigma h min. So it should be a plane. You, you may think this as you here on this line we have a hinge. If there is a hinge on that line, it's a plane that is going to hinge on that hinge. And it's going to move from SH max to SH min, an angle beta going from SH max to SH min. All right? So if I'm assuming that my hinge is here, I'm going to draw this first fault as that line over there. And this is going to be the angle beta. Uh, so if this is beta, notice that also this angle is going to be beta. And therefore, what is going to be the strike of that fault? Um, so, okay. North, 30 degrees, west, right? We, we could write like that, like that one, like this. And what about the dip? The dip is 90 degrees, right? Um, I hope you're looking at uh, my YouTube videos. <laughs> uh, and now something else. Uh, okay, let's assume now that we have the hinge somewhere over here. It's going to be exactly the same thing, 
but uh, just to make the example a little bit clear, let me add this. I'm drawing this in red. Probably you can see very well over here, but you're going to see in the videos. And if I have the hinge now in this line, the conjugate solution or the other solution is going to be this, in which this is also beta. And what is going to be the strike of that uh, fault now? The dip is going to be the same, and the strike is going to be uh, 150. Mm, what? Well, uh, you're so if you're using this convention, the angle has to be between zero and 45. Okay. Let me change a little bit the convention. So if this is 60, the angle between the north and that line is going to be 30, right? <coughs> 90 minus 60, 30. So I'm going to use the other convention. Zero, 30 degrees. That one is the second one. So uh, let, let me, just in case, uh, you cannot see that very well. This one is number one. And this is number one, and this one is number two. Okay? Let's go a little bit further. What would be, now that we know that strike and dip, what would be the representation of those faults in a stereo net plot where this is the north? This is the east, south, and west. And here we have angles of 30 degrees and 60 degrees. Where would fall number one plot? First of all, remember that here uh, you have increasing dip. This is 30, this is 60, this is 90 degrees. So we already know that our dip is 90, right? And it's going to be, the points are going to be somewhere located in this outer circle. But now the question is, where, where is that point? Remember the point is called a pole and it's a line perpendicular to the plane. It's not the plane itself. It's a line perpendicular to the plane, okay? So, you let me stop, okay? I'm gonna start moving from here, and you let me, tell me stop, where I should stop for number one, okay? We're going for number one. So, there, up, there, why there? If I assume that this is an angle of uh, 30 degrees, this is the one that represents, I'm going to draw this line, but usually you don't draw this line, okay? That's a strike of the fault perpendicular to this, you find this point. Uh, sometimes, you know, if this is a vertical plane, also that point may show up over here. Number one, number one. And for number two, now you tell me to stop again. I'm going to start from here. Now we're going for number two. We're going to number one. Number two is going to be somewhere over here. Uh, where again, number two is now I'm looking from the top, remember? This is the line of the strike. So that would be the stereo net for those two faults. And we're going to do one more thing uh, for this strike slip uh, case. We're going to draw the 3D more circle for this, okay? Just one more minute, guys. I'd like, to, uh, like very much to finish this example so we can pick it up next time from here. 
uh, this is tau, what is the maximum uh, principal stress? Sigma h max, right? So let's say sigma h max is somewhere over there, and if this is the, the failure line, and this is a circle that touches that line, this is going to be sigma h min, and let's say that sigma v is somewhere over there, I'm gonna have two other circles over here, and the planes of failure have a shear stress, a normal stress combination that are right at this intersection. Number one and number two, they are both at this place. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have enough time to explain that now, but we now we, we're going to talk a lot about this 3D more circle later on, okay? But uh, I'll explain that later. All right. Thank you, guys. I'll see you on Friday. <laughs>